good stability uh, and uh, running the spectrum from uh, laxity due to uh, soft tissue reasons uh, through to dysplasia uh, for obviously bony reasons. And I think um, hip instability is a concept that really didn't um, have much traction when I started uh, doing arthroscopy. Um, I was taught that the hip was a stable joint uh, uh, throughout my uh, residency and uh, training. Uh, and uh, so the uh, idea that there could be instability was sort of a new one. Uh, obviously, in dysplasia, it wasn't totally new, but um, I think this has been uh, kind of a spectrum that we've come to understand. So uh, in uh, this talk on dysplasia, uh, I'm going to stick with sort of the uh, uh, role for uh, arthroscopy, and then Dr. LaRue is going to uh, talk uh, more about uh, the bony procedures that we perform around dysplasia. Uh, but we'll talk about the diagnosis. Uh, I do want to mention the importance of the PAO, although uh, Dr. LaRue is going to discuss the details. Uh, I'll talk about the indications for arthroscopy, run through a case, and run through some of the outcomes. So. It's probably uh, one of the major causes of premature osteoarthritis in young adults, uh, right next to femoral tabular impingement. <clears throat> and um, back to that uh, slide I showed in the first talk at the conference yesterday, everything is not, not everything is FAI, not everything is impingement. So dysplasia, uh, you've seen this slide before, uh, this is a, an edge loading phenomenon uh, in which there is damage uh, to the labrum at the edge or to uh, the um, uh, bone at the edge of the Acetabulum. Weiberg described the lateral center edge angle and defined these thresholds. Uh, more than 25 was considered normal, 20 to 25 was borderline normal, and less than 20 was dysplastic or pathologic. The natural history is a bad one. It starts with the lack of bony support and progresses to increased load on a hypertrophic labrum, labral tearing, uh, anterior superior migration or subluxation and ultimately eccentric loading of the acetabular cartilage, which leads to early onset of arthritis. So uh, let's just mention the importance of a PAO in uh, treating dysplasia. I think that a PAO is the first line of treatment at this time uh, for uh, dysplasia. Uh, the, it's the only surgical solution at this time which truly corrects the deformity. Uh, so anything else that we talk about arthroscopically is uh, treating uh, parts of the problem, but not addressing the underlying bony deformity. Uh, so arthroscopy, I would say, should be considered only if PAO is not an option, uh, and we'll talk about when that is. Uh, so I'll leave the PAO uh, talk to Dr. LaRue, but there's a pre and post-op uh, x-ray addressing dysplasia. So basically, if this talk is about arthroscopy, then we're talking about people who are not a candidate for a PAO. So who is not a candidate for PAO? Uh, high level competitive athletes, uh, perhaps um, uh, we want to avoid a PAO, and I'm mostly talking about pros. Uh, mild dysplasia, uh, center edge angle 20 to 25. Uh, uh, Dr. Jackson addressed uh, some of that in his talk on instability. Uh, patients uh, more than 50 years old, Probably in this uh, category, uh, a PAO is not worth it. Um, Justin can uh, say whether he'd uh, feel the same way, but uh, certainly I think we'd take the tack that the older a patient, uh, the less likely it's worth it to do a PAO. Uh, and in the back of our minds is the fact that eventually there's a hip replacement as a solution for them. So in a, a 70 year old who has dysplasia, uh, we treat them with a hip replacement rather than a PAO, it would probably last them the rest of their life and give them a great result. Uh, so that's the extreme case, of course, where we're probably not doing any hip preserving surgery on that patient. Pre radiographic osteoarthritis, uh, we use degemeric uh, MRI, and Justin talked about that yesterday, uh, to quantify how much cartilage desiccation there is. Uh, there are certainly uh, other ways of looking for pre, pre radiographic OA, such as subchondral uh, sclerosis or cyst formation on uh, MRI, but this has been a useful tool for us uh, as an additional data point. So here again, if they have too much arthritis uh, or too much cartilage desiccation, then it's probably not worth it to do a PAO uh, because we, if we're doing a PAO, we want to be buying them a substantial amount of time. And then lastly, x-ray changes of degeneration. Uh, these, these are joint space narrowing or subluxation of the uh, femoral head, uh, those things probably make it um, not worth doing a PAO. Let me grab my charter. So I'm getting nasty notifications.
deviations from my Mac. Uh, so, in dysplasia, then, when is arthroscopy indicated? So, indications for arthroscopy, uh, as I have said multiple different ways, patients who are not a candidate for a PAO, I think uh, we want to stay away from anybody who's got joint space narrowing. Uh, no lateral migration of the femoral head. Patients probably less than 55 years old, because I think, again, uh, if we get much older than that, with dysplasia, in the setting of dysplasia, then patients are probably better served with a total hip. Uh, Justin will talk about uh, when uh, arthroscopy can be complementary to a PAO, so uh, I'll skip through that, but um, as far as the concurrent uh, treatment with an osteotomy, but we also can employ arthroscopy either pre-osteotomy or post-osteotomy in certain circumstances. So pre-osteotomy, we might consider it for an in-season high-level athlete uh, or for some temporary treatment uh, uh, prior to a planned PAO. And again, that mostly applies to an in-season professional athlete. Um, post-osteotomy, uh, if there's persistent pain due to a labral tear or a cartilage flap, uh, PAO could, uh, excuse me, arthroscopy could be used uh, to address those intra-articular problems. So here's a case of arthroscopy and dysplasia. This was a 22-year-old with two years of right hip pain and uh, uh, labral tear, a slightly diminished degemic index, but at 22 were uh, an intact joint space. We uh, feel this is a patient who's a, uh, in the joint preservation category, not the arthroplasty category. So arthroscopically, we see this very hyperplastic labrum. Uh, this is a big fat labrum, probably 10 millimeters in width, uh, and it's obviously got a very large tear, uh, almost a complete chondrolabral separation uh, from uh, the anterior, in the entire anterior superior quadrant and part of the posterior superior quadrant. Uh, so uh, we don't treat this with arthroscopy alone. We treat this with a concomitant arthroscopy and PAO, because if we treat this labral tear with arthroscopy alone, no matter how good our repair is, with this bony morphology, that repair is gonna fail. It's gonna be uh, edge loaded and um, it'll come apart. So with a complementary PAO, then we protect uh, the labral repair. So uh, if you are treating labral tears in dysplasia arthroscopically, don't resect the labrum unless you're planning a labral reconstruction because the labrum has a critical importance in absorbing the loading forces and preventing subluxation in the dysplastic hip. Uh, so we've seen that the load-bearing role of the labrum is uh, as much as 11% of uh, the load in a dysplastic hip. Uh, if we resect any part of the labrum, we have a risk of worsening the instability and of subluxation of the hip. Um, you uh, have heard about this uh, technique uh, for labral repair yesterday, and I uh, showed this in the live demonstration, but uh, I think that uh, in certain hyperplastic labra, uh, a labral base refixation can be helpful. In others, uh, where there is um, too much instability of the substance of the labrum, uh, a loop stitch can help stabilize the bulk of the labrum. So uh, Dr. Jackson talked about uh, the technique that we've advocated for capsular plication. Uh, and um, remember that in dysplasia, instability is the problem. Uh, it, there's a bony reason for the instability, but there's also soft tissue reason. Uh, so if we're doing any kind of arthroscopy in a patient who has instability or dysplasia, always preserve uh, or plicate the capsule. Uh, we certainly don't want to sacrifice any of the static stabilizers of the hip in this kind of situation. So let's talk through the outcomes a little bit. Uh, there have been some good results and some bad results published in the, in the past. Uh, Dr. Bird published uh, quite good results in a series of uh, 48 patients back in 2003. And these were predominantly labral uh, debridements, but they were, uh, I've talked to him a lot about this series, that these were very well-selected cases. So when he says dysplasia, these were mild dysplastic cases, a lot, a lot of times with uh, a, a femoral uh, FAI deformity, so CAM type morphology, uh, and patients in whom he didn't feel that instability was really the problem. Uh, so that said, he had better results in uh, young patients with acute onset of symptoms and worse patients, not surprisingly, uh, in older patients or those with evidence of arthritis. Now conversely, um, Jay Parvizi uh, very candidly published uh, horrible results in uh, 34 patients with labral debridements in uh, dysplastic hips. And uh, in these cases, uh, 
There was a complete failure to relieve pain in 14 patients. There was an acceleration of arthritis in 14 patients, migration of the femoral head in 13 patients, and 16 out of these 34 underwent further surgery. Uh, so these were absolutely miserable results. And this, along with um, uh, uh, some other smaller results, led a lot of surgeons to stop doing arthroscopy altogether in the setting of dysplasia, and maybe wisely so for a little while. Uh, I think that uh, in looking at concomitant PAO and arthroscopy, we found a useful role for arthroscopy in uh, these patients. And uh, again, Justin will talk about this, but we've done uh, a multi-center study with Boston Children's uh, and looked at the intra-articular findings in, the, in the, our, our first series of 17 of these concomitant procedures. And basically, we found intra-articular pathology in almost all of them, uh, usually labral tears or um, or cartilage damage, and uh, these injuries were um, addressable arthroscopically. So uh, Dr. Jackson talked about capsular plication and borderline dysplasia. I think uh, for me this was sort of the game changer uh, because we had uh, patients over with a CEA over 25, those patients who did not consider dysplastic, but patients with a CEA of 18 or less, those we thought of as good candidates for PAO, but this population with a CEA from 18 to 25 uh, was really a mystery gray zone population. The PAO surgeons didn't feel that they needed a PAO. The arthroscopists feared them like the devil because uh, the, they feared bad results with uh, arthroscopy in that borderline dysplastic patient. So this is where I think we found an important role for a soft tissue procedure for borderline dysplasia with a capsular plication. Uh, so we had 22 patients in the study with borderline dysplasia, and I'll just repeat a little bit of what Dr. Jackson already said about this study. Uh, these were treated with labral repair and capsular plication uh, using an inferior shift technique. Um, you saw the video of that already. And we included patients uh, with uh, a CEA of 19 to 25, minimum one year post-op. They all uh, had an evaluation for PAO with uh, myself and Dr. LaRue. Uh, and uh, we excluded patients uh, who had previous hip surgery, leg calvae perthes, uh, age greater than 40, tonus greater than uh, two or greater, or uh, dysplasia worse than that. Um, so uh, we showed very nice outcomes in this patient population with uh, an average of two-year follow-up. Uh, in improvements in all of the patient reported outcome scores, uh, and that was sustained for the two-year period. Uh, and uh, visual analog pain uh, scale obviously decreased substantially very high significance to these results. Uh, the range of motion we were a little worried about, uh, if we tightened the capsule, we wondered if we would lose range of motion of the hip with any uh, functional significance. And what we found was uh, we did lose a little bit of external rotation, and uh, this was statistically significant. So uh, external rotation went from an average of 59 to an average of 48. So it was statistically significant, but my feeling is it's not clinically significant. In other words, that loss of uh, 11 degrees of external rotation, I don't think impacted uh, these patients adversely. Uh, they may have had a, a little bit more uh, challenge in putting on shoes or socks uh, in getting their uh, legs crossed over, but none to the degree that they couldn't do so. Uh, so I think that there was minimal clinical significance to that loss of range of motion, and frankly, we expected and hoped for uh, a loss of external rotation. I think that's how we're achieving uh, the results we wanted. So, uh, we had 17 patients with uh, uh, modified Harris hip score greater than 80, uh, four, another four with greater than 70, one uh, patient was revised and subsequently had improvement after the revision. Average patient satisfaction was 8.4 out of 10, uh, plus or minus 1.4. So overall very favorable results <clears throat> with that technique clinically. Uh, radiographically, there was no uh, migration or escape of any femoral head afterward and no progression of arthritis greater than uh, tonus grade one uh, within the uh, study period. No perioperative complications, two revisions, uh, both due to uh, re-injury in sport. And uh, ultimately, uh, these results show improved outcomes in uh, what I think is a difficult cohort of patients, uh, and those outcomes are based on patient-reported outcomes. Uh, also importantly, it's a, a shown to be a safe procedure with no catastrophic uh, results. Uh, I think that um, 
Dr. Jackson addressed the fact that it's a, a technically challenging procedure uh, and um, that shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, it took us a long time to work out a technique that I'm, I'm ultimately happy with and uh, I'll try to demonstrate that in the lab uh, here in a few minutes. So in summary, uh, PAO is the first line for dysplasia, period, end of story. Um, concomitant arthroscopy and PAO is our method of choice uh, for dysplastic patients uh, with center edge 18 or less. Uh, and 100% of those patients uh, had intraarticular pathology in our series. Uh, for uh, <coughs> patients who have borderline dysplasia, center edge of 19 to 25, I think arthroscopy can be successful if the labrum is uh, preserved, repaired, or reconstructed, and the capsule is plicated. Thank you, and I'll make way for Justin.